Okay, so this was a 30 something year old female came in with palpable swelling in the right abdominal wall. I'm just going to quickly scroll through the rest of the scan, but focus on the area of interest. We did a chest, abdomen, pelvis, but nothing, no other significant findings in the remainder of the scan. This was kind of the area in question. I think so someone I think might have shown this case, but but okay. I still don't remember the exact diagnosis, but I have some theory. Okay. But my fellow is here, so I'm going to ask him if he has any. <laughs> okay. And if oh, I have shown this case, apologies, you can delete the recording. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it's always good because we don't, you know. Don't remember. If any of the residents online, I saw that the Trinity residents are online. So what do you guys think about this? Any ideas? No history of surgery, if anyone is thinking about. Yeah, it looks like it has like a hyperdensity in it. Right, right. So that and part we were not sure. And if you put it on narrow window, it looked like some debris or layering stuff inside it also. I'm just going to talk since nobody's talking. So <laughs> some things that come to mind are hematomas. You can get rectus sheath hematomas spontaneously. Right. Um, endometrioma. Right. Um, which doesn't usually calcify, but can be T1 hyper intense. Um, an abscess, spontaneous abscess. Okay. Um, other things in the abdominal wall, we think about desmoid tumors, but it looks a little hypo dense for that. Right. So those were kind of the things we went through. The only other thing we thought of was some unusual gossip aboma type. Is this some retained surgical material which has formed a collection around it? Um, we did not think this was some kind of a tumor of the abdominal wall, felt more like a collection of some sort. So hematoma, no coagulopathy, no traumatic history. We did ask for history of endometriosis. She did not have any. There were actually two collections. I think there's one more here, which seemed like it almost had a track going to the serosal surface of the uterus. And there were calcifications in it too. So it was two things we were evaluating. Um, and I'll show you the MR if, and just that'll just confirm that there was no pre T1 hyper intense signal at all for an endometrioma. And this we even asked if she had had, like it looked like a good C section scar site collection, also, right? So no endometriosis, just peripheral enhancement. So that layering stuff was just debris. It was not anything solid or nodular to be concerned about a tumor with necrosis. So we didn't know what it was. We gave some atypical infection as our differential. She was from um, Honduras, I think. So with history of being from not from the United States, we said consider some kind of atypical infection. Um, I was bold enough to suggest cysticercus because it's in a muscle, it has calcification, it's kind of a collection. Um, but it went to aspiration slash biopsy and my resident called me and said it looked like it yielded chylus milky white material. It didn't look like pus. So that was interesting. And then, of course, they did cultures and everything and it came back TB. So yes, I remember it after a little bit, but I was keeping silent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, maybe the worried. calcification, though, is a clue. Right, retrospective. Calcify. Right. Yeah. And then TB can cause tracts like this with calcification. So unusual, we had not seen an abdominal wall TB like this. But of course, I did a quick Google search and there are multiple case reports where they've described this. And when it comes out through the abdominal wall, they will call it like a collar button abscess or something. And the reason TB likes to go to muscle is apparently because muscle has very high lactic acid content and it's richly vascular. So the bugs like to grow inside muscle. And this can be clinically silent till it starts to bulge through the fascial planes like this. Interesting. Um, I'm just thinking about the person who did the biopsy if TB wasn't on their mind. Um, no, afterwards. it was not. It was right, not. right. So like, but I remember there were some cases where people got really exposed to TB, but it was like, I think aerosolized TB where they had to, even take some um, TB drugs preemptively. Right. 
So, so she got put on ATT. They have drained this collection. So she's on six months worth of ATT now. Very cool. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Go. Okay. All right. So this was a woman with I guess cancer. I think I think colon, uh, colon cancer was metastases. And this was an outside study that was reported. And you know, the study was reported that um, you know that there was a hydronephrosis bilaterally because you know these big bulky metastases are um, obstructing, and the liver was reported as normal to some cysts. Any thoughts? I mean, I'm seeing those um, cysts in the liver, and can you just slowly scroll through the liver again? We're not seeing other, like, these are probable cysts, I guess, with, um, but an MRI would be more definitive. Victoria, is there right. something around so, the left portal vein? Yeah, look at that. Right? Yeah, attenuated and this. The left, the left portal vein is attenuated. And then you see that there's this kind of very ill-defined rod there, right? So when you look at the coronals, right, right there. And then, sorry, we go up. Can you see it? This is actually... Meta, you know, the, the peritoneal implants that are going along the ligamentum teres into the fissure for ligamentum teres right there. And then you see that in case and contract the, the, the left portal vein, probably also like invade into parenchyma, but that's, you know, it's hard to say if it's just invasion or, or, or contraction. So um, that was cool. For the patient, but um, but I just you know you have to be careful. Um, and this was the appearance like this was was like this for a few scans, but the most remote CT. Uh, actually, let me stop sharing. So I'm afraid I'm gonna flash. Or, or you want to pause? And, you know, this is let me just take off the overlay completely. Um, so you can see that uh, this is like a couple months ago. This is. Not come out so about 18 months ago. You can see that, that the left portal vein was completely nicely open. You can see there was nothing in the fissure, and this is the round ligament going up, and it's completely free of disease. As opposed to now, I'm just going to put them side by side. You can see that the left portal vein is completely gone. You know, this this is a very subtle kind of hypodensity, but it's real. But the, like, the thing that clues you in is that we lost the left portal vein. And again, if you follow the what used to be a normal ligamentum terrace is now just kind of tumor sitting on top of it. Excellent. Okay. So this is um, a patient with colon cancer. Let me just take away the overlay. So you can see this is MR with EVIS, hepatobiliary phase. You know, uh, over the summer, you can see all these little hypodense, hypo-intense areas. Those are the metastases. So then the patient came back uh, uh, last month, so like maybe five months after this original CT. Amar, sorry. Um, and, I didn't see the original. I think. Oh no, was this? Is this the original? No. The 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 one on the on the I only see one image. Left. Only see you like be seen two. Nope. Only right one. Side by side? Nope. Oh, oh, this one? Okay. Do you see this this one? Yes. Okay. So this is this patient had MR with Evis in uh, sometime over the summer. Um, and you can see all these little uh, space occupying rounded things. Those were uh, colon cancer metastases. This was a big cyst. Um, so patient had uh, you know, went to chemo and then came back but five months later for, um, for follow-up assessments of his metastases. 
You can see that some of his metastases are a little bit better. Um, some of them decreased in size, for example. That's not what I'm showing you. So anybody wants to kind of take a stab at what's happening? SOS. Yeah. Yes. So you can see that the texture, this is this is very obvious, right? The entire louver, even though the liver still is able to pick up evis and excrete it, you can see that here on on you know on the initial study is when you look like, you know, for example, for this uh, this portion of the liver, it's nice and uniform and smooth and doesn't have much texture to it unless there's a lesion there or um, you know, or vessels going through. As opposed to here, right, so this will pick up like about the same level, you can see that the, the parenchyma has a texture to it, almost like a sandpaper. This is fair, and there's no abnormal signal intensity on other, um, on other uh, sequences. So this is a um, sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, and we see it, you know, even uh, hepatobiliary phase is the most, um, the most accurate way to diagnose it, and that's what we see. We see kind of like like sandpaper like appearance and it can be focal and it can be um, you know not focal it can be uh, uh, diffuses in this case um, and it can really affect liver function and usually it happens with like platinum based chemotherapy and then the um, okay go okay so this is a companion case this patient is also has uh, colon cancer and you can see this is the baseline. MR again, very nice, beautiful hepatobiliary phase. And you know, she's a little cancer there, a little nut there. Um, okay, so then patient had um, had um, a follow up study. And now, as we move through the patient had hepatectomy, you can see there, and then had a, a follow up chemo. Now you can see that these kind of very strange areas in the right hepatic lobe. And the intermediate signal intensity that some areas as well. Um, let's see. Here's um, on our arterial phase, you can see these areas are you know, hyper enhancing. Doing this. Sorry. Let me do this to the. Um, so this is the the hepatobiliary phase. You can see you can see these areas also have quite serious um, signal loss on hepatobiliary phase. Okay. Okay, so you can see that this area is also um, demonstrating kind of almost target-like appearance, right? You can see that. So whenever we see target-like appearance on diffusion or anything really, like that's a concerning appearance. So uh, the patient went for biopsy. So any thoughts of what's happening? Well, when I see targetoid on diffusion, I think about abscess, METs. Um, it would be rare to have and suddenly have epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. Um, something that can give you targetoid is like peliosis. Right, all great guesses. This came back as SOS. Oh wow, focal. So this, is, this is this is past, so SOS can be focal, but this is like a very acute um, appearance. Um, so this is like an acute. Usually, we see the, the most abnormalities we see on kind of hepatobiliary phase. Maybe there's something on like portal venous phase, some some heterogeneity, but not but. We really don't usually see any any sigma abnormality on like arterial phase or T2 or diffusion, but this seems this is probably a sort of acute, pretty pretty considerable um, uh, SOS, and then it, it comes up as a very very uh, abnormal signal, and then over time, let me just stop sharing so I can bring up the, the um, a, a few. This is about uh, three months after the biopsy, two months after the biopsy, you can see that these areas are contracting and we just see them, this, you know, more, more, you know, more like usual appearance. Um, you can see that 
here that the, the signal is kind of normalized on T2. Um, and it's gotten much better. Here we go, right? So all this, all that abnormal signal is pretty much gone. And we're just left with that, you know, hypointensity incompatibility phase, which is um, what we generally uh, see. I'm sorry about all these uh, technical issues. No, it's okay. I'll fix it later. Um, so I'm sitting with uh, some of my trainees, and I, I see we have the residents online. So I just want to explain a little bit more about SOS. So sinusoidal obstruction syndrome um, happens in the liver. It's also called blue liver syndrome. Used, it's sort of what used to be called, I think, veno-occlusive disease. But it happens when patients are on either oxaliplatin um, therapy, like Folfox, which is often used for colon cancer or pancreatic cancer. Um, or chemotherapy pr prior to bone marrow transplant. And it's basically breakdown of your sinusoids. And so there's a tr translocation of the blood, um, the blood cells, like it basically disorganizes your tissue and your sinusoids start breaking down. So your liver gets really heterogeneous and congested. And in the OR, they would see it as like a blue liver. They call it a congested liver or blue liver. And, it, and if they try to do surgery on that blue liver, it can cause like catastrophic bleeding. So they try to get it before then. Um, with patients undergoing bone marrow transplant chemotherapy, they weigh the patients and they watch for um, you know, tender right upper quadrant, like basically their liver getting congested and tender. And then the treatment is basically taking them off the therapy and your liver can recover. So she just showed, maybe they took the, the patient off that chemotherapy and the, the liver recovered from that. But you do wanna sort of pay attention to it. And Victoria has shown us like several now amazing cases where on EAVIST phase, um, where you can see the parenchyma better, you're seeing more of that reticular pattern and heterogeneity in the liver. And so you should bring that up if you see it like, oh, this patient is on a oxaliplatin, this could be SOS syndrome. So that the surgeon, I've been called from the OR before where they're like, why didn't you tell us it was blue liver? And like, you couldn't see it on any other sequence. And on that scan, we didn't have any of us, so. All right, one more. Um, okay, so this is, again, I'm, you know, I'll, a very narrow area of, of cases now, but this, this was a patient with uh, thyroid cancer metastases. And you know you can see they're multiple, but I just want you to see like this area, right? Just kind of like you had a genius few lesions, and I want you to appreciate the extent of metastases that we see on the moss. You can see that this entire uh, right hepatocle was completely replaced by tumor, and a lot of this is really not appreciated on CT. You can see that. So this is why I love know, MR CT, for anything liver. Huh? <laughs> this is why I love uh, MR for anything liver. Right. Well, you know, um, you know, there, there are a few reasons why this is happening, right? So one is, um, you know, CT is, um, you know, doesn't have as great of a soft tissue contrast resolution. So, um, it, you know, it little lesions a lot of times it won't pick up. Uh, but also routine, like unless we do, you know, here it was just routine follow-ups so we didn't do the, you know, the, the, the three, four phases that we do, let's say for HCC and your endocrine metastases. So routine portal venous phase can, can really under, underestimate the, the level of um, involvement, of, especially hypervascular metastases. Because the smaller ones often won't wash out. They will just, they enhance nitro phase and kind of become iso enhancing on portals in this phase. So T has double one, you know, that we don't have multiple phases and um, soft tissue conscious resolution is about, you know, it's, it's subpar to MR. Um, plus we don't have diffusion, you know, on, on CT. So a lot of tools that we have on T2, right? A lot of tools that we have to improve our sensitivity on MR, CT doesn't have. And then finally, bone mets too um, were much better seen on MR. I think in your case, mm -hmm. you could still see them on CT, but I find also bone mets on the diffusion yeah. can stand out a lot more that before they're even apparent on CT. Right. Um, but that, that's provided you have uh, diagnostic diffusion, which is not always the case. <laughs> okay. Acute case of, you know, this is a patient, patient with colon cancer and kind of abdominal pain. You can see that. The patient has um, a fecal cancer right there. Probably coronal is going to show it a little bit better, but you can see 
um, away. Why is it not? There. So you can see this is a tumor. Okay, and it's in the strategic location where it involves the appendiceal origin. And this whole thing is just dilated, thickened appendix, which ended up perforating. So I've seen this a few times in my in my career that I've seen um, fecal cancer obstructing appendix and presenting with appendicitis, appendicitis, which is what happened in this patient. And he already had liver metastasis. That's all. Excellent. Um, okay, Josh? Sure. Yeah, I'm going to be sharing from Rupa's computer. So okay. since we were showing some cases of, uh, you know, what happens in response to therapy, the images on the right here are um, the patient had a history of endometrial cancer. It had it resected. This was a follow-up PET scan on the right that showed a couple retroperitoneal lymph nodes that were now FTG avid. The patient was then started on pembrolizumab, and this is a follow-up CT or PET CT on the left four months later. Uh, as you can see, the lymph nodes down here have resolved in the retroperitoneum, but then moving up to the mediastinum, these were all new, <clears throat> enlarged FTG avid, mediastinal, bilateral, hyalur lymph nodes. Um, so any ideas on that one? like some kind of reaction to the immunotherapy? It is. So this is something called sarcoid-like reaction that happens with immune checkpoint inhibitors. It's only about one to 2% of the time, but we, I've got a couple cases from this year already. So we're starting to see it more and more often as immunotherapy uh, gets used, but it's a lot of these patients don't previously have any history of sarcoid, um, but they can get uh, this lymphadenopathy. They can get pulmonary nodules. Um, so it's worth keeping in the differential and somebody that, you know, is unlikely to have hyalur like metastatic disease. In this case, it was biopsied and it was granulomatous inflammation. Very cool. Okay, so this is a um, pelvic case. Tell me if you see anything. Vaginal mass. Okay, good. So um, is it vaginal or let's say this is the I think it's urethral. What is it? I think it's urethral. Actually urethral. Yes, exactly. Urethral. So we've got this evil gray of tumor of this urethral mass. Um, so it, yeah, this is just a really nice example of a urethral cancer. And um, this, so rectum, vagina here, this muscular vagina, and then it's basically involving the posterior wall of the urethra. I'll show you on another view. So normally we have a sort of the muscular layer of the urethra and we can see the posterior wall of the urethra. We've got this tumor that's also invading the vagina here. Um, so nicely seen uh, T2 hyperintense tumor. Um, this, uh, so urethral tumors, proximally, they tend to be more urethelial cancer and distally, they tend to be more squamous cell cancer. Um, and then if they're affiliated with either uh, a diverticulum or Skene's gland cyst, they, then they can be adenocarcinoma. Um, this was a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, it's more of a distal tumor. And then another cute part of this uh, case was this. So we want to look for lymph nodes. So the more distal the tumor, it spreads to the inguinal lymph nodes. The more proximal the tumor, it spreads to the uh, pelvic sidewall nodes. And then we've got this in the inguinal region. So is this a metastatic lymph node? Somebody's writing into the chat. Let me check it out. Uh, Victoria says she had a urethral tick adenocarcinoma on her boards. Oh, wow. We've had a few cases here. Um, I had a large uh, tumor in a diverticulum. But anyway, what do you guys think about this? lesion here. You can show it on the post contrast. Do you, have do you have diffusion and contrast? There's contrast. It's pretty avidly enhancing. It was really T2 dark. It seems, you know, connected to the stuff going into the inguinal canal. Um, diffusion. Yes. There's diffusion. We see my tumor. Oh, this is the 
So there's the tumor and there is the inguinal lesion. Not super avid. This is, oh, the ADC, it is restricting. My tumor is also. But I think the T2 is more suggestive. Is it like a round ligament lyomyoma or something like that? Yes, it's yes. Too yes, dark yes. on T2. Yeah. So we don't have path on it because basically we called it a, most likely a, a lyomyoma of the round ligament. Um, and on a follow-up exam, the um, urethral tumor had gotten much smaller, but the uh, this lesion had stayed exactly the same. So we feel pretty strongly that it's a round ligament lyomyoma. We, it looks like it's, you can see like the round ligament going straight into it. Um, you can get these anywhere that you have smooth muscle and it's nice and T2 dark, as dark as muscle. Okay, going to pause. So yep. obviously this is a uh, pregnant patient getting an MRI. Um, I'm gonna show you a few different views and findings. So um, first, show you this. Okay, so any thoughts on this sagittal view? There's something inside the placenta, I think. Um, interesting. Where the placenta or, was actually, um, it was actually like, or is that a, just a very collapsed rectum we're seeing very posteriorly? Oh, this stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. a rectum. That's um, outside. Yep. And then this is a foot. Can we go to the? What's happening Sorry, to the talking? bladder? Bladder in the baby. Oh, this is the bladder is just being pushed. Somehow. That's not the finding. Is there liver? The baby's liver looks abnormal. No, I think those are the legs. No, no, the oh, liver of the baby. <laughs> up, okay, wait, up here? Oh, is that just bowel? <laughs> <laughs> We're not fetal uh, radiologists, but anyway. Um, no, the, I think the bladder is quite distended. There's a gallbladder here, I think. I think that's the liver. Those are the fluid-filled lungs. Um, legs, that look, their legs are crossed. Very cute. There's a foot. There's some feet. Hey, um, the cervix is open. The yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, so no. The membranes are prolapsed. So like basically we don't even see a cervix. It's completely dilated and there's a prolapse of membranes here. Um, so that was one finding. Excellent. Okay. The next finding is actually this thing, which I'm going to show you on some other sequences. So, you know, it looks like it's the foot, but it's not unless it's like a long extra toe, something next to the foot. And It was here. I know, is this a blood clot? Good thought. So it's really T1 bright, um, could be a blood clot. I'm gonna show you the axial. Arti Kedar says, is it a twin with a hemorrhagic sac? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's, it's very T1 bright. And if you notice, there's something else that's quite T1 bright inside the baby. That's all echogenic bowel. Oh my God, meconium. Oh, meconium. That's meconium. Yeah. Oh my stain. Oh, very nice. Oh, yeah. wow. That is amazing. So, so this patient actually is... had partial rupture of membranes with meconium stained fluid coming out. Um, so I just had my fellow Smith at the very last minute, look up <laughs> some facts about meconium in the, um, in, in the amniotic fluid. So a couple of things are wait. that, what? Wait, why was she on the scanner? Uh, oh, because like, they wanted to, um, just make sure everything else was okay before they took her to the, to, to C-section. Okay. Just yeah. like randomly? Um, I can't actually remember it. Let's see. Oh, she was having abdominal pain. It's not mine. How old is she? how 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 far along is the baby? It was she was pretty far along. She went straight to um, to surgery, and actually there was one more interesting finding, which is that we thought she also had a septate uterus because she has the septum. Oh, that's cute. Okay, can I teach you a trick on how to estimate the the baby's age on the mark? Sure. 
Okay, bring up sagittal, mid sagittal slice. Um, okay, but the sag is low in the pelvis. We don't even get the full. Oh, okay. Do, yeah. do you have do you have like um do you have a scout that includes sagittal? No. Okay. But the trick, the generally the trick is because that's how OBs estimate like um, they have this coronal. Uh, well, um, if you can reconstruct, you, you need a sag though, right? Because th then you basically estimate, like yeah, emulating what OBs do. You know, okay. uh, if you have, if you had a baby, or, or like if you've seen, or if you remember from OB training, they measure from superior uh, pubic symphysis. And they palpate the, the top of the um, uterus, and that measurement after 20 weeks is fairly accurate in terms of how many weeks the baby is. Oh, so, you can sort so of if it's estimate. like 30 centimeters, then yeah. it's 30 weeks. Correct. Correct. Okay, from your pubic symphysis. So you, you just, you just, you just, and, and sometimes it's helpful if they forget to tell you, and mm. you're looking at, 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 at baby, you know, the MR, and you want to try to figure out like where you are, you can estimate this, you know. Uh, yeah. approximately cool. how many weeks very cool you um, can probably do that like if you if, like even in corona you can probably estimate like if you go from top of the uterus to top of the synthesis you you probably get like a rough roughly correct estimate yeah um it's probably i think she was she was actually like further along than 30 30 she i think she was like 36 or 37 you do, yeah but you do you're doing this straight right on the side so you can, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you, yeah you would take into account the curve a little bit so yeah. But it gives you like an idea. Sometimes they forget to tell you and you, you don't know. So sometimes it's helpful. Okay. But it only works after 20 weeks. Okay. So a um, few facts about meconium peritonitis. Um, it's seen in about 12 to 20% of patients, but it's much higher in post dated births. So pat patients who have gone beyond 40 weeks and 41, 42 weeks where it's up to 40%. Um, and it can be due to, it can be due to normal GI maturation, but it can also be a sign of acute or chronic fetal hypoxia. Um, and then other things that can cause it are placental insufficiency, preeclampsia, peripartum infections, and cocaine. Um, if the baby aspirates the meconium, it's called meconium aspiration syndrome. So if they have the meconium tinged, um, amniotic fluid during delivery, they'll immediately try to suction the baby um, after they're like, you know, right after they're born and try to get the meconium out. Um, in the long term, though, meconium aspiration syndrome can occasionally cause pulmonary hypertension and air leak syndromes. So anyway, this was uh, pretty far along. She had meconium, uh, like partial rupture. So it wasn't completely ruptured. That's why we still have a lot of fluid. And we had some uh, actual visual visualization of meconium in the, in the amniotic fluid. Um, and uh, Rupa says she's going to study meconium mechanics. Yes. So, but it can be normal, like, you know, just a sign of normal GI maturation later in pregnancy. So it's not always a bad thing. And yes, Nelly, you can um, switch with me. This is an MRI done um, multiple years ago. And I'm sharing uh, pre T1 sequences. Um, so I'm getting your eye centered to the pancreas. Congenital variation of the pancreas. Uh, so what we see here is uh, the pancreatic head here, it's uh, T1 bride. Uh, and I love the T1s, pre-T1s for the pancreas, uh, but the body and the tail is, is gone absent and this and it's been this way and we have a follow-up uh, imaging that shows that that's been stable for multiple years uh, we got an mrcp images and there's um, little ipmns but the you see the main pancreatic duct here and this is probably uh, draining the pancreatic head here and it goes into the duct here but there's no accessory pancreatic duct uh, so this is dorsal agenesis of the pancreas and I'm gonna show you this nice cartoon that I have that I pulled from um, ResearchGate. Uh, so the embryo embryologic origin of the ventral and dorsal pancreas, the dorsal pancreatic duct is here and it kind of, it's like the reverse of book opening, right? Or if you completely open the book and kind of fold it, um, the, the dorsal aspect kind of fuses with the ventral aspect with development. Uh, and the dorsal aspect has the pancreatic head, which is what we see here, and that's the variant that we see here. The, the ventral 
um, but it, it's it's not developed. There's no um, there's a genesis of it, so we don't see that. And in our case, um, you can have partial agenesis where you see persistent accessory duct um, with you know persistence of minor papilla. But in our case, we didn't have that, so it was a complete um, agen um, agenesis of the dorsal um, pancreatic bud. Uh, it's a just a congenital variation, uh, something to be aware of. Cool. Does it have any clinical implication or they have enough um, islets there to make enough? Um, so they can get hyperglycemia. So here's a, a Radiopedia article that goes into the different manifestation. This patient did have diabetes. Uh, so they can get um, hyperglycemia, I guess is associated with SPEN uh, tumors. We don't have it here. In this case, uh, they can get polysplenia, pancreatitis, and uh, intestinal malrotations. Very cool. I have one like that, and the patient has like polysplenia and uh, heterotaxy syndrome. Okay, so we are alternating, right? Okay. Um, this is my next case. What do you guys think about the spleen? You also show the um, coronal, if you guys want. And there's multiple like low density lesion. It looks like there's not nodular enhancement, um, at least in that, that one that we're seeing now. Yep. Um, so I want to say something benign, like a hemang hemangiomas. Um, yeah, so that's the seen, question here. Is this a hemangioma? We've seen cases of angiosarcoma, and I don't know that I can differentiate those two. Okay. And then there was an interesting aspect of this where the patient, uh, we, you know, we asked, is there any trauma? They said there was no trauma. Um, but one thing about hemangiomas in the spleen is that they don't usually have um, this like very nice nodular enhancement the way that um, that liver lesions do. And we are also like in a, a bit of a later phase. We're not really in the arterial phase. So it's interesting that it still looks so blobby like this. Um, there was a more delayed phase and actually it looks like it's kind of filling in. So. Still, Mangiomo was on the differential. And um, the other weird part about this, these lesions is that it almost looks like the, the borders are a little irregular. Do you see how it looks kind of linear here and all this stuff? So anyway, this is a lesson in not believing the patient because um, then we also, you know, we still were like, I don't know, this could be a big pseudoaneurysm. Let's look for other signs of trauma. And on the bone windows, you can now see that there's actually several um, rib fractures and they look pretty acute. So one, two, three. So um, we became convinced that this was ac an actual trauma case and that this was a pseudoaneurysm in the spleen. Um, they went for angio and um, like a thousand angio images, but hopefully I'll pick the right one. Uh, and yeah, you can see here that there's extravasation into this uh, into this large um, hematoma with this large pseudoaneurysm. Actually, sorry, sorry, it's not a pseudoaneurysm. It's basically active extravasation in this laceration. So um, they embolize this, and now it's now it's no longer bleeding. Okay, so don't fall for hemangioma. Actually, I have something. Um, I want to say about that. When I was a first year resident, I, I saw a case and I saw, I saw a big blobby enhancing thing in the liver and I thought it was a giant hemangioma. And um, the person, uh, the fellow I was working with was like, yeah, this is a giant hemangioma. And, you know, was like telling me all about giant hemangiomas. And then the attending came in, they were like, oh my gosh, this is huge liver laceration. What are you guys talking about? And the clue was that there was an overlying rib fracture on, on one side of the liver and there was an adrenal hematoma, like the adrenal gland was like enlarged and was there was a hematoma. And that happens when you have like a compression injury between the rib, the liver, and then it like smashes the adrenal gland into the, um, into the bones. So there were all these like secondary signs, like even if it was mimicking a hemangioma, but like look for all these secondary signs if there's any possibility of a, of a, of a um, you know, a laceration. 
Okay. Um, so what do you guys think about this MRCP? What is going on with the, and there's, I mean, I see the CBD, but then there's some kind of signal, like, um, it's, it's, it's weird. Um, so something <laughs> at the upper CBD and then there's signal, which it looks like a, like maybe portal. I don't know what's going on, but, um, like just left lateral aspect of the common bowel duct. Exactly. Exactly. So there is, so this is probably the pancreatic duct. This is probably the CBD, but if we didn't see this, we would have thought this was probably the CBD. We see a large T2 hyperintense fluid filled structure, right? Um, so they can have surgery. Do they have, have they had surgery? Nope. Okay. So this is the finding. And uh, axial. So what is that bright T2 fluid filled structure? You can see the bile duct is over here. Anatomically, it's the portal vein. <laughs> yes, exactly. So this is the portal vein and it's filled with uh, bright fluid. And this is a pancreatic- Oh, from like mucin fistula. or something. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so this patient had had, you know, chronic multiple bouts of pancreatitis. They actually have this kind of pseudocyst in the head and it had eroded into the pancreas. So we can see the flow void of the SMV and then the pseudocyst eroded into um, the portal vein and uh, caused a pancreato portal fistula. So I remember one of my um, board review, somebody showing a case of this, and it was always super tricky on the MRCP because you think it's a bile duct, but it's actually the portal vein. Um, this patient actually did okay. They tried to um, stent it. So the, the end, endoscopist, like the treatment would be stenting across this so that the pancreatic juices can um, come down and you know not feed the pseudocyst that's feeding the, the portal fistula, but they were not able to get through the fibrosis in the pancreatic head. And then um, the IR team tried to go in and they were able to cannulate this and they thought they'd be able to drain it, but they weren't able to get much of the fluid off. Um, they did get some off and send it for micro and it grew back actually a dental bug, um, strep and uh, engendosis, I think. Um, so I don't know how the, no, streptococcus parasanguinus, um, which is from dental plaque. So I'm not sure how that happened, but maybe they have a dental abscess and it got into their blood and then seeded um, the now, you know, infected portal fistula. Um, 